Well, thank you for that. That was beautiful, but also powerful. Jesus can do something that no one else can do. Catch the message of that song? That's great. That is absolutely true. If you have your Bibles, open one last time to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Story of David and Goliath. And if we can this morning, look at some final thoughts about how the battle is the Lord's. There are some things that God does. There are some things that we do with God's help. But I love the fact that in this story of David and Goliath, which, which we've looked at over the last little bit, we see something happens in here that only God can do. Sometimes, sometimes, God really shows up. Now in your life, you've maybe asked yourself, why doesn't God always show up? Well, he always shows up. He's always at work. But sometimes, in a special and an extraordinary kind of way, God does something outside the box. I want to talk this morning, if I can, and preach this morning on this fact, the battle is the Lord's. You know what? I don't want to live an ordinary life. I don't serve an ordinary God. I don't come to an ordinary church to worship an ordinary Savior. And God wants to do something in every single person's life and heart. That song referenced the fact that, that what Jesus has done, talking about specifically in salvation, only Jesus can take a messed up, broken down, ruined life and do something amazing out of it. We didn't have the time this morning, but if we did, we could have testimonies where people talk about what God has done in their life, and you'd find out that people around here throughout this auditorium that come from just messed up background situations, but Jesus moved in, and he fixed the thing up, and he doesn't do a half-baked job at it ever. And we find that in David and Goliath. I've told you before, but I love the story of David and Goliath. If you missed the one where I had a full-size Goliath over here, then look it up on YouTube. You can see the size of Goliath. He's bigger than we remember him being. Our problems are always bigger than someone else's problems. David was bigger than, or Goliath was bigger than most of our problems. He was huge. We looked at how, how David... You did some things, and when God works through us, it requires some commitment. I want you to realize a couple of things this morning as we begin, that at times your faith will be challenged. Your faith will be challenged in this life. Sometimes it comes in the form of a diagnosis. Sometimes it comes in the form of a letter or a phone call or text message. Sometimes it comes in the form of a bill. Sometimes it comes in the form of a tragedy. But your faith will be challenged. It may be from a coworker. It may be from an obstinate boss. But your faith will be challenged. In this account of David and Goliath, David's faith was challenged. Every soldier's faith was challenged that day. Both sides. Remember, the Israelites had seen Goliath and they ran scared. The Philistines had their faith in Goliath. The Israelites' faith was challenged and the Philistines' faith was challenged. Your faith will be challenged no matter what you believe in. This story has told us that we can always be encouraged by God's past faithfulness. When David stood before Saul, Saul said, listen, David, you're but a youth, and Goliath, uh, he was a man of war from his youth, and David was reminded and encouraged by God's past faithfulness. David, remember, he told us, he said, Saul, listen, there was a bear that came for the sheep, and God helped me have victory over the bear. There was a lion that came. And don't miss that. I mean, I, I can't just imagine David sitting there, a lion shows up. I mentioned this in church that morning, but you have, you have to be David, like, really, Lord, a lion? A lion. King of the animals, a lion? Why not like a little, you know, like a little armadillo? Because an armadillo doesn't require any faith on our part, does it? Armadillo doesn't require us to exercise any faith in God, but a lion shows up and David is encouraged and encourages Saul by God's past faithfulness. You and I can be encouraged by what God has done before. We sang that song this morning. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Encouraged by God's past faithfulness. 
This morning, I want to look at this thought, though, that God's answer in this story and in our life will be undeniable and unbelievable. Look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 49 again, if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. I did not bring my sling with me this morning. I didn't want to embarrass any more men by showing how I can use this sling that I used twice in my life. No. I had a terrible job of that thing. I almost, you know, I, I thought for sure that morning I was going to injure someone. But David slanged that stone, smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Verse number 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. At this point, Goliath is dead. The Bible says he slew him. Goliath is dead. When did it happen? When the stone hit his head and he fell down. Who guided the stone? David or God? Who slang does? I like that word, slang. Slung it. Who slung it and slang? I don't know what, what English. Who launched the stone? David did. Now, God could have launched the stone. Could he not have? He could have sat there. The Lord, he wouldn't, but he could have been there like, watch this, ding. No problem for God. He wouldn't have to use his proverbial finger. He could have just had a thought. But David had to launch the stone. But David might have been a good shot with that stone, but that shot wasn't just a good shot. That was a miraculous shot. Goliath was dead and Verse 51, therefore David ran. Second time in the story that David ran. He ran to face Goliath, and he ran after he slew Goliath. And stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of his sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Lord, I thank you for the time we have this morning. Lord, a few moments to look at your word. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be challenged today, be touched by the truth from your word. Lord, I don't know all the situations that I'm faced with this morning in this crowd, but you do. Lord, you know the heartache, the trouble, the places where ultimately we need to see your hand at work. Lord, I'm praying this morning that our hearts would be challenged, our thoughts and minds would be turned towards you. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that today they would trust you and believe in you today. Lord, we sure love you. Thank you for this time. Help me now. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know that God still wants to do amazing things? We can read the Bible sometimes and think, well, that's a really neat story. That's a really neat account. And, and I wish I had been David. I wish I'd been there that day. But it, we kind of fall into this trap. That just happened back then. And God still doesn't work that way today. God still doesn't do amazing things. And my friend, I'm here to tell you that God not only wants to do amazing things, he still does amazing things. God still wants to show his power no less in 2021 than he did whenever this exactly took place four or 5,000 years ago. God wants to show himself strong. I want to notice three things and point out three things this morning when we want to see that the battle is the Lord's. The first thought is this, that in the, when the battle is the Lord's, that God often and usually uses the ordinary. God normally uses ordinary situations to do something extraordinary. In this particular account, God used a stone. Now, if you'd been God... What would you have used? I'll give you a few options. What about a lightning bolt? That would have been extraordinary, would it not have been? What about a tornado? And pick Goliath up, spin him around till he's dizzy, put him back down, pick him up again. Right? What about ants? Now help me here. What about ants? I mean, if you were God that day, what would you have used to, to, to defeat Goliath? God used a stone. I have stones at my house. I've got part of a gravel driveway about going back to my pole barn. One of the young people was there the other day, and I had some water next to my driveway, and they loved nothing more than to pick up stones and throw them into the water. I'm fine with that. 
You can come to my house and throw all my stones in the water. I'll order some more. Stones are ordinary, though. You can find stones about anywhere, can't you? You go outside and find some rocks in the parking lot. Don't throw them at someone else. All right? You're a Goliath. Oh, no, 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 please don't do that. My point is this, that God uses the ordinary. You see, this plan that David had didn't look like a good plan. Remember, Saul tried to talk him out of it. David, you're not dressed for battle. And David goes and picks up some stones. If, if, you're, if you're a soldier that day, David, all right, get the biggest rock you can find. All right, boys, let's all gather around the boulder. We'll throw the boulder at Goliath. And yet David grabs just five smooth rocks. It didn't look like a great plan, the rocks and the stones that he used. You see, no success could be seen from the outside. It didn't appear that anything special would happen. It's just that this young boy was running to face his certain doom and gloom. And he was going to go out with a hurrah by slinging a rock at Goliath. You see, God loves to use the ordinary things. No success could be seen. No secrets were shared. They weren't magic rocks. Didn't years ago they used to sell pet rocks? This was what back in the, I believe in the 70s, 60s, 70s? Is this the, t- the time frame? Do I have this right, adults, in the room? I know, in the 80s? I know we love to pick on the younger generation, but we're not buying rocks. <laughs> they also sold chia pets if you want to go down, down that road as well. A pet rock. A pet rock, really. This is my pet rock, I've named it. George. These this day that that David grabbed, they weren't a pet rock. They weren't magic rocks. They were ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill rocks. And God took an average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, everyday rock and turned it into a giant killing machine. Only God can do that. God loves to use the ordinary. You see, it didn't look like a great plan. And David didn't look like a great fighter. David didn't look like a great... I'm reminded of that when I think of Samson. Samson, mightily used by God, many flaws in his life. But no one could figure out why Samson was so strong. Because I believe Samson didn't look to be strong if he had been just ripped like... Thank you, honey. She says, like me. Thank you. They would have, no, it wasn't funny. <laughs> I have feelings too, you know. Wow. I think if Samson had just been ripped, they would have known, well, that's why you're strong. Samson, look at your muscles. Look at your biceps. Look at your chest. Look at your back. Look at your leg. You're obviously, you know, Samson's strong because he's just naturally gifted. He's a beast of a man. But they couldn't figure it out because Samson's strength didn't come from his muscles, came from his God. David didn't look like a fighter. David didn't look like a warrior. David didn't look like he'd have any chance of success. You see, God loves to use the ordinary. David couldn't go off past experience. You see, David had never killed a giant before. He couldn't go on YouTube, top three ways to kill your local giant. He couldn't go down local Home Depot, do it yourself, giant killing for dummies. David had to depend upon his God. And God loves to use the ordinary so that he gets all the glory. Often in life, you'll be faced with things that you've never seen before. You'll say, this is like nothing in life I've ever faced. But there's nothing in life that God hasn't seen before. An ordinary young man, ordinary rock, but an extraordinary finish. Throughout the Bible, it is filled, the Bible is filled with Bible characters who are just ordinary. Who are just maybe just a small town, simple person. Maybe you know the names Shipra and Pua. Not many people name their daughters Pua. A lot more Davids out there. Shipra and Pua were the two midwives who stood before Pharaoh and delivered countless babies for the children of Israel. 
and defied the ruling king, the pharaoh of the, of the world at that time. Two ordinary ladies serving extraordinary God, and God blessed them because of it. Maybe you know the name Bezalel. Bezalel was a simple man who truly was the architect of the temple. God gave the job of a lifetime. You might have heard and heard, probably heard about Ehud. Ehud slew a king. Small passage of scripture. God used him two reasons. He was willing and he was left-handed. God uses the ordinary things. Lord, why did you make me this way? Because I've got a special plan for you. I've got a unique plan for you that only you can do for me. He had used because he was willing and left-handed. Shamgar, another not-too-known Bible character, mentioned one time in Scripture, yet he had time to kill 600 Philistines all by him alone himself. He was a warrior used by God. Asa, a king, he was a son of godless parents who became a godly king. He said, God, why'd you put me here? You can still live for me. Hashai, a counselor of David who successfully infiltrated enemy ranks. All were regular, ordinary people who the world might say and might deem unimportant, but in the hands of a mighty God, something special happened. See, number one, God used the ordinary. Number two, God changed the contrary. God changed the contrary. You see, in this situation, you have David and Goliath, but you have all the armies, the armies of Israel. It was contrary situation. They felt that it was hopeless. They couldn't see a way out until David showed up. Remember that from down here, the view isn't always that good. There are times in your life and my life that quite frankly the view stinks if we're looking at it from down here. And in this account, the view kind of stunk. All they could see was a huge giant. It appeared hopeless. Someone said this, there are no hopeless situations. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them. You know what's great about a hopeless situation? Only God can fix it. Only God can fix it. I don't know what your hopeless situation may be. Sometimes the prayer requests come across a desk. Sometimes they cause me to just to pause. I think, wow. Now, there are many needs. In this church, I hope you pray for each other, many needs. Sometimes there are wild ones, are there not? Sometimes you're just like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Sometimes life seems hopeless. Sometimes down here the view just flat out stinks. And maybe in your life today the view stinks. Maybe all you see is giant. All you hear is giant. And everyone else around you has bailed. Not only did it appear hopeless, everyone acted helpless. They're running back to the tents. Everyone who should have didn't. They tell me that if you put crabs into a bucket and that if one begins to climb out, the others will yank that one back down to the bucket. Now, I've never tried this, but I would say it happens with people sometimes too, wouldn't you? You ever felt that way? Situation was hopeless. You're trying to get a little hope in life. And it feels sometimes that the people who should be pushing you out are pulling you right back down. You ever feel like you're in a bucket of crabs? I have before. I tell you, it's even once in a while happened at church. Right? Not a simple one like this, but I remember before I got married, I'm dating my wife, Doreen, and and, uh, this one right here, same one. I love her. 
We had what we had during the time of family emphasis session, and someone had taught a lesson, Mr. Bill Swain had taught a lesson on how to keep zing in your marriage. All right? I did not go to a lesson. He came to me, and after he goes, hey, he goes, hey, Brother J.D., I use you and Doreen tonight because Sharon and I love to hang out with you guys. You guys are just in love. This is wonderful. Someone came up to me a short time after that and said, hey, Mr. Swain talked about you. Just wait a few years. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? I know what they're trying to say. It happens not just here, I'm not picking on church, but it happens here sometimes too. When life looks like it's hopeless, you're trying to get out of that bucket, and you feel like the other people who should be helping you are just pulling you right back down. But see, God can change a situation that is contrary. Not only if it appears contrary, but if it feels contrary, and everyone else acts like it's contrary. Because you see, God uses the ordinary, God changes the contrary, but God lastly demonstrates that he is extraordinary. The God that you and I serve is not like any other God. God directed the rock that day. David put it in motion. God did the rest. God declared himself that day. That day, God showed up. So that when they walked away, they realized this was not just a normal battle. This battle was the Lord's. You see, God wants to show up in your life. God wants to show up in your relationship. God wants to show up in your marriage. God wants to show up in your family. God wants to show up at work. God wants to show up in your bills. God wants to declare himself to you. But not only to you. There's a part of this passage That I love. It's verse 54. Would you look at it with me, please? It says, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. Now, help me here, folks. David just killed the largest man known at that time, right? Goliath. Cuts off the head, and what does David do with it? He carries it to Jerusalem. Say, that's disgusting. Oh, really, hunters? We understand this in Michigan. Look at the deer I got as you flip through 400 photos and show me the deer you got. Right? You do that to each other too, don't you? And if it's a real big one, you take this head to another person, usually another man, who says, wow, yeah, I can make that look real nice for you. And you put this carcass of a head on the wall so that other men, all right, not the ladies, or most ladies, at least some of you ladies for sure, but mostly men walk in and say, wow, that's a nice deer head. And you get to hear the ensuing story about it, about your manliness and the shot of your life. It increases with every time you tell the story, right? The first start, it was three feet away. You hit it with your car. (laughs) Five years later, it was a two-mile shot, and you had a slingshot like David. (laughs) Best story I've ever heard was Mike Stewart, by the way. Used to, a man here and works downstate now. Uh, Mike Stewart had shot a deer, and the next day was looking for it, was carrying a knife in his hand, came upon the deer the next morning, and as he grabbed the deer by the antler, the deer stood up on his hind legs, and Mike killed it with the knife. Now, that's a deer story. How'd you get that deer? With my knife. Come on, you real men. You don't jump from the trees. David carries this head back to Jerusalem as a trophy. As a trophy. This is what God did. Look what I got me. I got me a giant. Oh, you got a deer? Look at this thing. Plop. We don't know how big that head was, but it was the biggest head around because God was the biggest guy around. You say, Pastor, that's disgusting. Why are you telling us that? Because not only did David bring back a trophy, David brought back a testament. If you remember where this story started in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David shows up and everyone is hiding. Everyone is scared in their tents. At the end, they're all singing and jumping around, praising the Lord for what God did. And there is a whole group of people who now believed that giants could be killed. 
Up until this point in Scripture, we have no record of a giant or no record of giants being killed. You know that by the end of 2 Samuel 21, four more giants are killed. Four more. Ishbinabab, Saph, brother of Goliath, and the man with six fingers. So much so that one of them almost got David, and one of his guys said, Don't worry about it, King, we got this one for you. Over here, they're all scared. They're all hopeless. They're all hopeless. Helpless and hopeless. But when God shows up, though, all of a sudden, everyone thinks they want their own giant. Where's another one? I got to get me one just like David. You see, when you allow God to use you, when you allow God to work in your problem, not only will God do something undeniable and unbelievable, but he'll do something that's encouraging. And what you may be going through is probably not just for you. Maybe for someone across the auditorium who doesn't believe that a giant can be killed. Who doesn't believe that God can show up. But when God uses you and they see what God did in your life, they want God to work in their life. When you go around swinging that giant head, look what God did. Look what God gave me. Look what God gave me. Sure, I had to pick up the stone. I had, to, I had to sling the rock. That's what I had to do. And God called it. And he'll call upon us to do those things, to do our part. But this is what God did. All of a sudden, there's a whole group of people who are like, I want, I want one for me. Let God solve your problems. When he does, it'll be unmistakable, undeniable, unbelievable. He may tell you, to pick up your sticks and do something for him first, like the widow and the prophet. He may tell you to cast your net on the other side of the boat. Fish a little bit more when it doesn't make sense to fish any longer. He may tell you to get out of the boat and take a step on water. And you didn't know anybody besides him who could walk on water before. He may tell you like he did to Gideon, you've got too many reinforcements. You've got too many backup plans. I want you to go there with just a few, Gideon, so you know it's me who did it. He may tell you, like Paul, to get on the boat that's headed for a shipwreck. When, the, when you're swimming in the water, heading toward an island, you're thinking, God, where are you at in all this? And God said, well, I've got a snake that's not going to harm you. I've got a land who needs the gospel. And Paul, when you leave, everyone's going to be touched by the gospel. You see, when God shows up, it's amazing. But it's not just for you. Maybe for someone else. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the Lord our God. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. My friend, this morning, I don't know what battle or what giant or what problem you may be facing, but I know that he does. I know that he wants to use the ordinary. He'll use the ordinary things in your life, ordinary situations, ordinary uh, issues and those things. He uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. I know that he uses the ordinary. I know that God can change a situation that is contrary. He can turn it around. And it doesn't take him very long to do it. Number three, I know that God is extraordinary. When he shows up, when God works, he'll have a testimony and a trophy. This is what God did. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Biggest problem that day was not Goliath. Goliath fell with one little rock. Did he not? Biggest problem was not Goliath. Biggest problem that day was lack of faith in God. You see, when David comes on the scene, the only thing he did that was different was trust God. Anyone could have killed a giant that day. Plenty of rocks around to go around. 
but only one man walked by faith. This morning, Christian, this morning, my friend, it's time to walk by faith. Maybe you're a God that looks helpless and hopeless. Walk by faith today. Trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lead not to thine own understanding. Take the next step. Lord, it looks like there's no solution. Pick up the rock. Lord, I don't know what I can do any longer. Let him work. Trust him. The only difference that day was that David had some faith. Problems in your life? God can solve them. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you're a God who loves to solve the impossible situations. Lord, I don't know all the situations represented here this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be honest before you and to search our hearts. And I wonder if here this morning with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if maybe this morning you need to be reminded about some faith in God. Maybe life seems hopeless. Maybe you feel helpless. Perhaps everyone around you, you feel, is pulling you back down. Can I encourage you, my friend? Walk by faith today. Just take the next step. What I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? As you spoke, God spoke to me. I need to be reminded about walking by faith. Touch my heart today. Would you pray for me? He would say, that's me, Pastor. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Who else? Amen. Who else? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I don't know that if I died today I'd go to heaven. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'd like to know how to, how to go to heaven. I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, that's me, Pastor. I've never trusted Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for me, but I'd, I'd like to know more about that. My heart was touched as well. Who'd say, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me this morning? In just a moment, we'll pray and then stand to our feet. I would encourage you that if God's touched your heart, you'd come and pray and do business with God. So take that next step of faith. If you need someone to pray with you, we'll have ladies and men up here who'd be honored to pray with you. If you have some questions, if you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open the Bible and show you how you can know for sure those people would spend the time with you. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, there are many who have indicated by an upraised hand to be reminded of faith in you, Lord. I pray you'd strengthen their hearts and their faith, Lord. Help them not to be weary and well-doing. Lord, to walk by faith, not by sight. Lord, I pray that anyone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that today the day they trust you. Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to your feet, if you would, please, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Come and do business with God here. If you need someone to pray with you, just slip out to the front. Well, folks who would be willing to just pray with you, if you want someone to talk to, we be glad to do that as well this morning. Lord, thank you that you work in hearts and lives. Lord, thank you that your power is not weak. Lord, that your observation is not limited. But you see all things. You know all things. Lord, you can solve all things. Lord, help us to trust in you and walk by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.